We should have known that Thursday night. <laughs> Dallas, let me just say what a blessing you are to this church. Amen. Now, will you pray with me? God, we gather here once more to learn how we can draw a little closer to who you have created us to be. So I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to start this morning with some responses from children when they were asked to give a definition of love. Rebecca, age eight, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Billy, age four, says, When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. And Terry, who's also four, said, Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. And Danny, age seven, says, Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. (laughs) And Jessica, who's age eight, said, You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. (laughs) And probably the one that struck me the most was from a six-year-old named Nika. Nika says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Now, I think these kids are spot on, and I think they have a much better grip on what love is than a lot of us. You see, as we go through life, as we age, we learn things, both good and bad. We experience things, both good and not so good. Our judgment gets clouded, and we lose that sense of innocence and wonder that children have. See, they're not tainted with the world yet. Our readings this morning are about love, our love and God's love for us, and about God's faithfulness to us. Today, in our first reading, we take a look at the life of Joseph. Now, if we back up a little bit in the book of Genesis, we get a better understanding of the reading today and what has led up to where our reading starts. In Genesis 37, verses 3 and 4, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So from the very beginning of Joseph's life, he was placed in a dysfunctional situation. Now, I don't know if you know anything about dysfunction, but I do. (laughs) Joseph's father favored him over his brothers, and because of this he was hated and he was mistreated by them. To make matters worse, Joseph caught them not handling their father's affairs properly. So he told his father about their poor behavior, which fueled the hatred even more. Joseph also had prophetic dreams, which was seen as a special talent in ancient times, and these dreams often foretold great success. And in Joseph's case, it foretold his great success. Then he dreamed still another dream, Genesis 37, 9 says, and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Well, this caused his brothers to hate him even more. 
But this hatred eventually turned to a spirit of murder. They wanted to kill him. But before they could do it, a better option came along, and they sold him into slavery. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So he's sold into slavery. Now he's at this Egyptian's house. He's, he's a slave for this person. But still, even in those circumstances, God was still there because God opened those doors. And can you imagine what Joseph felt like having been mistreated by his brothers, then being sold into slavery by his brothers, and now he was enslaved. Genesis 39, 7 through 9 says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what it is, what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept, kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Well, the wife didn't like this too much, so she told the master a completely different story, and convinced the master that Joseph had, in fact, had sex with her. So the master had him thrown into prison. Despite this great temptation, Joseph remained loyal to his leadership and to God. Even in prison, Joseph was highly favored and given a place of great authority. You see, during these times of testing, Joseph continued to grow in his abilities and talents through acts of service toward those he had been placed beneath. You see, he really was a good guy. He came to be, be a good guy. Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, and he changed his clothing, and he came to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it is said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. You see, Joseph interpreted the dream. He was chosen to interpret it, and he did. So the Pharaoh shows favor on him and he takes him out of prisoner out of the prison and he made him governor and gave him great authority in his region. So Joseph goes from being a prideful tattletale, an obvious favorite son, all of which caused his brothers to hate and despise him, sell him into slavery, and now he has great authority in the land. But we also learn that as Joseph grew, he gave glory to God, despite his circumstances. So when Joseph recognizes his brothers, they don't recognize him. So Joseph kind of toys with them for a little while, making life somewhat difficult for them and making them jump through some hoops in order to see if their character had changed. And then he reveals himself to them by telling them not to be distressed. For it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And as Joseph examines his life, he can see and has known that God has been with him the entire time. Now, 
I'm not sure that if I was in Joseph's shoes that I would not be a little bit angry at his brothers for having sold, sold me into slavery. But his life turned out better than all right. And even though that is true, I still can't say that I wouldn't be holding just a little bit of a grudge. So I asked myself when I was reading the story, so where, where was the anger? Where was his wanting the revenge? I mean, he was in a position of authority. He could have punished them. He could have tortured them. He could have even killed them. But he did what he had done most of his life. He took the high road. He understood that throughout his life, with all that had happened, that God was with him. God used the circumstances in Joseph's life for good. Now, things happen in our lives, sometimes because of other people and sometimes because of our own doing. God does not cause bad things to happen, as some might believe, but God uses what happens to us in our lives for good, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Now, most of us probably have not sold a sibling into slavery, though I'm, I'm sure many of us have wanted to. <laughs> but perhaps we can all read and hear this story with regrets for mistakes that we may have made and the relationships that may have been severed. Some of us come to worship today wondering if there might ever be a healing for those relationships in our lives that have been broken. We can read and hear the story of Joseph and his family torn apart by poor choices and unhealthy relationships, and then it becomes for us a frame in which we can look and see for sure the presence of God and the work of God. We know too well, left to our own devices, we are sure to live lives marked by estrangement and broken relationship. I mean, just look. It's all around us. But God is always with us, even though we are often blind to his presence. So how do we see God? How do we hear God? How do we know that God is always with us? How do we reflect God in our lives today? A good place to start can be found in our gospel lesson where Jesus is teaching. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Then again, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. That's, ta that's tough to do. That's a really tall order, to say the least. And see, none of us can do those things perfectly, and none of us can do these things all the time. For if it were that easy, our world would be a much nicer place. Love our enemies. Now, this must be pretty important because Jesus says it twice, but he's speaking of a different kind of love than what our children were speaking of. This is agape love, a wholehearted, unreserved, unconditional desire for the well-being for another. I think Nika had it pretty close. If you want to learn to love better, start with a friend you hate. Still really tough to do. I'm sure that we have all had things happen in our lives that have challenged us, people that have wronged us or people we think who have wronged us, people and events that have made our lives difficult, that have caused us to want to plot and even carry out revenge on others because we think that will make us feel better to get back at those who have wronged or shamed us. But then we read the words of Jesus in our gospel lesson and our plans go out the window. We come to realize that wanting and plotting revenge distorts our perception. It clouds our hope, and it extinguishes any possibility of community. 
Or we hear stories like this. Matthew Shepard was brutally beaten for being gay. He was tied to a fence and he was left until someone found him the next morning. He was taken to the hospital where he died. And the men who did this to him were arrested and convicted of a hate crime and first degree murder which carried the death penalty in Wyoming. But Matthew's mother, he went, she went before the judge and she asked that the lives of these two men be spared. Now imagine the pain and the agony she must have felt all those months after her learning of her son's death. Surely she considered these two men enemies. Surely she wanted revenge on them. Yet she practiced a love and forgiveness that goes beyond my understanding. You see, here at St. Jude's, we, finished, we just finished a book study on this book, Simple Prayer. It's called Simple Prayer, Learning to Speak to God with Ease. And one of the chapters in this book is on Simple Prayer of Forgiveness. And one of the stories in this book goes along with this, with the same um, vein that Matthew Shepard's mom Experienced. In July of 2015, an act of terror occurred in the town of Charleston, South Carolina, at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. It claimed the lives of nine people during a midweek gathering. And it's hard to comprehend such a violent demonstration of evil in a place that is supposed to be a place of refuge. The shooter was a white male, and the victims were all African Americans. But they were not killed for being Christians. They were killed for being black. This was not a faith issue. This was an issue of racism and hatred. When the loved ones of the victims were given the opportunity in open court to speak to the judge in the presence of the person responsible for the death of their family members, their words resounded with a, great, with a greater force than the impact of the bullets. They sounded like forgiveness. They sounded like Jesus. Each one of the survivors took the microphone and without diminishing their pain, offered forgiveness in the midst of their pain. You see, many of us don't forgive because we believe that we must be pain-free before we move on. But forgiveness isn't the after effect of healing. Many times it is the prequel These are but two stories that offer examples of what I believe Jesus is asking us to do today. And I'm sure we could all think of several more where people have expressed the ultimate love and forgiveness in horrible and tragic situations. Hopefully few of us will ever experience what these people did, but we live in a world where we hear about events such as these more than I care to mention. We don't, however, need tragedies such as these to practice these lessons. Our lives are full of opportunities every day to practice loving our enemies and doing good to those who hate us and doing to others as you would have them do to you, to forgive, to not judge, to not condemn. And in doing these things, we can be a reflection of God in a broken world because God is with us always. You see, God is still at work when a sibling is sold into slavery. God is at work when people hate us and curse us and persecute us. God is at work when people mistreat us, when they wrong us, when they judge us, when they condemn us. And God is at work when we forgive others and when we love our enemies and our neighbors. And wherever God is at work, there are glimpses of promise. You see, God is in the business of creating possibility where there is none whatsoever. Even in the midst of bleak situations, we can hope for healing because we follow a God who is known for taking the most painful, ripped up, and broken parts of our lives and stitching them back together. And wherever there are signs of life instead of death, these are sure signs that underscore the hope in our amazing God to which we cling every day. God makes possibilities 
out of what we think are impossibilities. God creates hope out of our hopelessness. And most unlikely of all, God can create peace out of our pain. So let it be so this day, dear God. Let it be so. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me, please? God, we try hard to get it right, but we know that we often fall short of who you would have us to be. We know you are always with us, but we get so wrapped up in our own brokenness to notice. May we pay a little more attention to your presence, and may that flow out into a world so that others may know your unconditional love. Help us to practice these radical lessons that Jesus taught us, and may our lives bring your light to a world that often seems dark. We pray this day for those with heavy hearts, for those grieving, for those who are sick, for those who are lonely, and for those who are afraid. May your peace find them and fill them. Hear our prayers this day, O oh God. Hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Now let us take a moment of silence to allow God to speak to our hearts.